the skydiver dropped out of hyperspace an even million miles above the neutron star. I needed a minute to place myself against the stellar background, and another to find the distortion Sonia Laskin had mentioned before she died. It was to my left, an area the apparent size of Earth's moon. I swung the ship around to face it. Curdled stars, muddled stars, stars that had been stirred with a spoon. The neutron star was in the center, of course, though I couldn't see it and hadn't expected to. It was only 11 miles across, and cool. A billion years had passed since BVS-1 had burned by fusion fire. Millions of years, at least, since the cataclysmic two weeks during which BVS-1 was an X-ray star, burning at a temperature of 5 billion degrees Kelvin. Now, it showed only by its mass. The ship began to turn by itself. I felt the pressure of the fusion drive. Without help from me, my faithful metal watchdog was putting me in a hyperbolic orbit that would take me within one mile of the neutron star's surface. 24 hours to fall, 24 hours to rise, and during that time, something would try to kill me, as something had killed the Laskins. The same type of autopilot, with the same program, had chosen the Laskins' orbit. It had not caused their ship to collide with the star. I could trust the autopilot. I could even change his program. I really ought to. How did I get myself into this hole? Hey, welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. Neutron Star is one of Niven's first short stories in known space. It's a great story, but you can tell Niven wrote it more as a fun thought experiment than as a part of a larger universe. That said, it still fits in just fine. And, like most fans, I have a few headcanon explanations for any parts that are a little questionable. Maybe I'll go over some one day. <laughs> Beowulf Schaefer was out shopping when he was approached by a rare sight, a puppeteer in public. It propositioned him with a job. One million stars, which was their unit of money, so basically a million dollars, to repeat a trip that a couple had tried. They wanted to swing past a neutron star at a distance of only a mile. They were in a general products hall, one of the strongest, if not the strongest, substance in known space. Created out of a single molecule, it was basically impossible to break, and no radiation could penetrate it. That is, except for visible light. The general product's halls were as clear as glass. Most people painted over everything but a window, but some left it entirely transparent. The Laskins believed that this hall made them safe. But after passing by the neutron star, they and their ship were destroyed. The hall was fine, but everything inside the ship was smashed into the nose, including... The Laskins. Their ship had been recovered, but the family was blaming General Products, the makers of the hall. They said it must have failed them somehow. So General Products, a puppeteer-owned corporation, launched an investigation. As part of this investigation, they decided to hire Beowulf Schaefer. He was exactly what they were looking for, a smart, experienced solo pilot who owed a lot of money. Schaefer was just such a man. He was in debt for around half a million stars, not all entirely his own fault. He was working as a chief pilot for a large cruise ship line, as in spaceship cruises. But unbeknownst to him, the company was failing, and they had not paid him in anything but promises for a while. But Schaefer still had to eat, and with money coming soon, why scrimp and save? So, he racked up a large debt and then lost his job. The company collapsed. But if he had told anyone that he could not pay for his debts, 
then he would end up in debtor's prison. So he kept racking up the bills so as not to draw attention by changing his habits. This is when the president of the Earth Branch of General Products approached him with an offer he could not refuse. Literally. They blackmailed him into taking a job of recreating the flyby that had killed the Laskins. It was that, or they would give him up to debtor's prison. So, half a million stars left over after paying off his bills? Or prison. If it wasn't for the imminent death, it would be an easy choice. Ten hours to fall. I unfastened the safety net and went for an inspection tour. The access tunnel was three feet wide, just right to push through and free fall. Below me was the length of the fusion tube. To the left, the laser cannon. To the right, a set of curved side tubes leading to inspection points for the gyros, the batteries and generator, the air plant, the hyperspace shunt motors. All were in order, except me. I was clumsy. My jumps were always too short or too long. There was no room to turn in the stern end, so I had to back 50 feet to a side tube. Six hours to go, and I still couldn't find the neutron star. Probably I would only see it for an instant, passing it better than half the speed of light. Already my speed must be enormous. Were the stars turning blue? Two hours to go, and I was sure they were turning blue. Was my speed that high? Then the stars behind should be red. Machinery blocked the view behind me, so I used the gyros. The ship turned with peculiar sluggishness, and the stars behind were blue, not red. All around me were blue-white stars. Imagine light falling into a savagely steep gravitational well. It won't accelerate. Light can't move faster than light, but it can gain energy and frequency. The light was falling in on me harder and harder as I dropped. I told the dictaphone about it. That dictaphone was probably the best protected item on the ship. I had already decided to earn my money by using it, just as if I expected to collect. Privately, I wondered just how intense the light would get. Skydiver had drifted back to vertical, with its axis through the neutron star, but now it faced outward. I thought I had the ship stopped horizontally. More clumsiness. I used the gyros. Again, the ship moved mushily until it was halfway through the swing. Then, it seemed to fall automatically into place. It was as if the skydiver preferred to have his axis through the neutron star. I didn't like that. I tried the maneuver again, and again the skydiver fought back. But this time, there was something else. Something was pulling at me. So I unfastened my safety net and fell head first into the nose. The pull was light, about a tenth of a G. It felt more like sinking through honey than falling. I climbed back into my chair, tied myself in with a net, now hanging face down, and turned on the dictaphone. I told my story in such nitpicking detail that my hypothetical listeners could not but doubt my hypothetical sanity. I think this is what happened to the Laskins, I finished. If the pull increases, I'll call back. Think? I never doubted it. This strange, gentle pull was inexplicable. Something inexplicable had killed Peter and Sonia Laskin. QED. Around the point where the neutron star must be, the stars were like smeared dots of oil paint. Smeared radially. They glared with an angry, painful light. I hung face down in the net and tried to think. It was an hour before I was sure. The pull was increasing, and I still had another hour to fall. Something was pulling on me, but not on the ship. No, that was nonsense. What could reach out to me through a general products hall? It must be the other way around. Something was pushing on the ship, pushing it off course. If it got worse, I could use the drive to compensate. Meanwhile, the ship was being pushed away from BVS-1, which was fine by me. But if I was wrong, if the ship was not somehow being pushed away from BVS-1, the rocket motor would send the skydiver crashing into 11 miles of neutronium. And why wasn't the rocket already firing? 
If the ship was being pushed off course, the autopilot should be fighting back. The accelerometer was in good order. It had looked fine when I had made my inspection tour down the access tube. Could something be pushing on the ship and on the accelerometer, but not on me? It came down to the same impossibility. Something that could reach through a general product's hull. To hell with theory, said I to myself, said I. I'm getting out of here. To the dictaphone, I said. The pull has increased dangerously. I'm going to try to alter my orbit. Of course, once I turned the ship outward and used the rocket, I'd be adding my own acceleration to the X-Force. It would be a strain, but I could stand it for a while. If I came within a mile of BVS-1, I'd end up like Sonia Laskin. She must have waited face down in a net like mine. Waited without a drive unit. Waited while the pressure rose and the net cut into her flesh. Waited until the net snapped and dropped her into the nose to lie crushed and broken until the X-Force tore the very chairs loose and dropped them on her. I hit the gyros. The gyros weren't strong enough to turn me. I tried it three times. Each time the ship rotated about 50 degrees and hung there, motionless, while the whine of the gyros went up and up. Released, the ship immediately swung back to position. I was nose down to the neutron star, and I was going to stay that way. Half an hour to fall, and the X-Force was over a G. My sinuses were in agony. My eyes were ripe and ready to fall out. I don't know if I could have stood a cigarette, but I didn't get the chance. My pack of Fortunatos had fallen out of my pocket when I had dropped into the nose. There it was, four feet beyond my fingers. Proof that the X-Force acted on other objects besides me. Fascinating. I couldn't take it anymore. If it dropped me shrieking into the neutron star, I had to use the drive. And I did. I ran the thrust up until I was approximately in free fall. The blood, which had pooled in my extremities, went back to where it belonged. The G-dial registered 1.2G. I cursed it for a lying robot. The soft pack was bobbing around in the nose, and it occurred to me that a little extra nudge on the throttle would bring it to me. I tried it. The pack drifted towards me, and I reached, and like a sentient thing, it sped up to avoid my clutching hand. I snatched at it again as it went past my ear, and again it was moving too fast. The pack was going at a hell of a clip, considering that here I was practically in free fall. It dropped through the door, and to the relaxation room, still picking up speed, blurred, and vanished as it entered the access tube. Seconds later, I heard a solid thump. But that was crazy. Already the X-Force was pulling blood into my face. I pulled my lighter out held it at arm's length, and let go. It fell gently into the nose. But the pack of Fortunatos had hit like I dropped it from a building. Well, I nudged the throttle again. The mutter of fusing hydrogen reminded me that if I tried to keep this up all the way, I might well put the general product's hull to its toughest test yet, smashing it into a neutron star at half light speed. I could see it now, a transparent hull containing only a few cubic inches of dwarf star matter wedged into the tip of the nose. At 1.4 G, according to that lying G dial, the lighter came loose and drifted towards me. I let it go. It was clearly falling when it reached the doorway. I pulled the throttle back. The loss of power jerked me violently forward, but I kept my face turned. The lighter slowed and hesitated at the entrance to the access tube decided to go through. I cocked my ears for the sound, then jumped as the whole ship rang like a gong, and the accelerometer was right at the ship's center of mass. Otherwise, the ship's mass would have thrown the needle off. The puppeteers were fiends for ten decimal point accuracy. I favored the dictaphone with a few fast comments, then got to work reprogramming the autopilot. Luckily, what I wanted was simple. The X-Force was but an X-Force to me. But now I knew how it behaved. I might actually live through this. The stars were fiercely blue, warped to streaking lines near that special point. I thought I could see it now, very small and dim and red, but it might have been imagination. In twenty minutes, I'd be rounding the neutron star. The drive grumbled behind me, in effective freefall. 
I unfastened the safety net and pushed myself out of the chair. A gentle push aft, and ghostly hands grasped my legs. Ten pounds of weight hung by my fingers from the back of the chair. The pressure should drop fast. I'd programmed the autopilot to reduce the thrust from 2 Gs to zero during the next two minutes. All I had to do was be at the center of mass in the access tube when the thrust went to zero. Something gripped the ship through a general products hull. A psychokinetic life form stranded on a sun 12 miles in diameter? But how could anything alive stand such gravity? Something might be stranded in orbit. There is life in space, outsiders, and sail seeds, and maybe others we haven't found yet. For all I knew or cared, BVS-1 itself might be alive. It doesn't matter. I knew what the X-Force was trying to do. It was trying to pull the ship apart. There was no pull on my fingers. I pushed aft and landed on the back wall on bent legs. I knelt over the door, looking aft down. When freefall came, I pulled myself through and was in the relaxation room looking down, forward, into the nose. Gravity was changing faster than I liked. The X-Force was growing as zero hour approached. While the compensating rocket thrust dropped, the X-Force tended to pull the ship apart. It was 2G forward at the nose, 2G backward at the tail, and diminished to zero at the center of mass. Or so I hoped. The pack and lighter had behaved as if the force pulling them had increased for every inch they had moved sternward. The back wall was 15 feet away. I had to jump it with gravity changing in midair. I hit on my hands, bounced away. I jumped too late. The region of freefall was moving through the ship like a wave as the thrust dropped. It had left me behind. Now the back wall was up to me, and so was the access tube. Under something less than half a G, I jumped for the access tube. For one long moment, I stared into the three-foot tunnel, stopped in midair, and already beginning to fall back, as I realized that there was nothing to hang on to. Then, I stuck my hands in the tube and spread them against the sides. It was all I needed. I levered myself up and started to crawl. The dictaphone was 50 feet below, utterly unreachable. If I had anything more to say to General Products, I'd have to say it in person. Maybe I'd get the chance, because I knew what force was trying to tear the ship apart. It was the tide. The motor was off, and I was at the ship's midpoint. My spread eagle position was getting uncomfortable. It was four minutes to perihelion. Something creaked in the cabin below me. I couldn't see what it was, but I could clearly see a red point glaring among blue radial lines like a lantern at the bottom of a well. To the sides, between the fusion tube and the tanks and other equipment, the blue stars glared at me with a light that was almost violet. I was afraid to look too long. I actually thought they might blind me. There must have been hundreds of gravities in the cabin. I could even feel the pressure change. The air was thin at this height, 150 feet above the control room. And now, almost suddenly, the red dot was more than a dot. My time was up. A red disc leapt at me. The ship swung around me. I gasped and shut my eyes tight. Giant's hands gripped my arms and legs and head, gently but with great firmness, and tried to pull me in two. In that moment, it came to me that Peter Laskin had died like this. He'd made the same guess as I had, and he'd tried to hide in the access tube, but he'd slipped, as I was slipping. From the control room came a multiple shriek of tearing metal. I tried to dig my feet into the hard tube walls. Somehow they held. When I got my eyes open, the red dot was shrinking into nothing. Hey, thanks for watching. I really appreciate you staying this long, and since you did, hopefully that means you like my channel. So I'd really appreciate it if you would like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe, so I can see you back here for the next one. Take care.